I wanted to talk with you about how I can put God first in life how I can put God first in life. Now, there is an, an actual principle at work in life, and you might not realize that it's at work, but it's currently at work in you, uh, determining much of your practical life, how it turns out, determining much of, really, just about all of your spiritual life. Uh, for lack of a better term, I'm just going to call it the law of the first. The law of the first, all right? So we're going to talk about first things, important things, ultimate things, prioritize the highest priority that you can imagine. So what this is saying is that what happens first determines what takes place next. What happens first and what you choose to do first determines what happens next in your life. First you sow, then you reap. First you honor your parents, the Bible says, and then you you will live a long life. First you give, then you receive. Something first happens, and then the next thing takes place. It's kind of cause and effect. I once used this example, but because my shirts don't fit me anymore, I was going to put another shirt on on top of this one. And then what happens is, I don't know if you remember, when you, when you learn to tie a shirt, usually kids start with a wrong button, right? Wrong button, wrong hole. So it's the top button, third hole. And then when they go down from there, they end up having a lot more buttons than there are holes left to fill, right? Because the way you start determines how everything else goes. It's the same thing in regards to when uh, we moved. Uh, I remember Robert helping me move, and him and I have never packed a truck in our lives before. And so we pulled all of the furniture out, we pulled the furniture out of the house. We put some of the smaller things in first. And then some of the bigger things couldn't fit on top of it because it would break it. So we had to fit it next to it. And eventually, we weren't able to fit much into the truck because we packed the wrong stuff in first. However, if you know how to pack a truck, you'll start with the big things, the big square things that can go at the bottom, like the foundation of, the, of, of your stack, right? You put the big things right in, boxes, and then eventually you get to pack so much more in. And what I want to say about that is, is what you do first determines what you get to do next. What you do first determines how much you ultimately get to do. It never fails. It never fails. If you think you have too much to fit into a day, you cannot pray. In other words, you can't pray. I've got too much to do. You're not going to fit everything into that day. But if you start your day with the Lord, somehow He allows you to fit everything in that needs to fit into that day. So what you do first determines how much you ultimately get to do. Almost every believer online, on online dating is what I'm referring to, on their site would claim this. And I, I've never been on a dating site I know a lot of people that have. And they say they're so tired of online dating because everybody that's a Christian always has to say, God is most important to me. My question is, what does that look like? If you say, God is most important to me, God is first in my life, what does that mean? What does that look like? That's what we're going to talk about today. You don't have to dig far, they say, to find that almost nobody knows exactly what they mean when they say, I put God first in my life. It's almost like just a cliche. It's just something people say. So today, I don't want to tell you to put God first. You already know to do that. I would rather teach on exactly God's emphasis he has placed on the importance of you putting him first in your life. And what does that look like when you do that? So the first thing I wanted to do is just quickly look at the Bible's emphasis on first things. For instance, number one, God has a specific interest in all firstborns. Throughout Scripture in Exodus 13.2, He says, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel both of man and beast, 
It is mine. God claims that which comes first. Exodus 13, 12. That you shall set apart the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstborn, there it is, that comes from an animal which you have, the male shall be the Lord's. The Lord claims all firstborn. Number two, we see that what they did on the first day of the week actually mattered to God. Look at Exodus 12, 16. It says, On the first day, hold a sacred assembly. On the first day, you should have a sacred, holy assembly. Get together on day one of the week. In Leviticus 23, verse 7, it says, On, this, on the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Then we also see, thirdly, that after the flood, this is after Noah's flood, Noah was still in the ark, God providentially caused the earth to dry up on the first day of the first month. This was not just a by-the-way statement. This was God designing something. On the first day of the first month, the earth was dry. Look at it in Genesis 8.13. By the first day of the first month of Noah's six hundred and First year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. Fourthly, we see that God was honored and worshipped with first fruit offerings. First fruits offerings. Proverbs 3 verse 9 and 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions. Let's just pause it for a second. Honor God with your possessions? Does that mean... I can, by my possessions, dishonor God? The answer is yes. If I make what I have God, I have dishonored Him. God will never give you something that will make Him less important. God did not give me a wife in order to make Him less important. You'll find that people, before they get married, it's all about the Lord, all about the Lord. Why? Because they believe the Lord's going to bless them with somebody they don't deserve. <laughs> right? Oh, it's just about the Lord. I'm just believing God's will. I'm fasting. I'm praying. I'm just believing. I'm keeping myself for this person. And then they get the person. They get somebody they don't deserve. And then suddenly, that person becomes more important to them than God ever was. God will never give you a car that makes Him less important. You often wonder why God takes something away from somebody. It's like, well, maybe... It started taking God's place. So God was honored and worshipped by first fruits. Again, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the, what? First fruits. The first of what He brings to you, of all of your increase. Why? So that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. In Numbers chapter 15, 21, it says, Throughout the generations to come, you are to give this offering to the Lord for the first of all your ground meal. Deuteronomy 26, verse 2, Take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for His name. Yes, Everything you have, everything that comes to you is from the goodness of God, the common grace of God. He causes the rain to fall upon the righteous and the unrighteous alike. The common grace of God is responsible for all of the development that we have had within humanity. Think about it for a moment. We used to be a small population in a small portion of the known world just a couple of hundred years ago. And now, we are feeding 8 billion people. How did this happen? How did this happen? The common grace of God. He allows us to develop in that way. I mean, there's nothing we have that didn't come from His hand. Your next heartbeat comes from the hand of God. And He's saying <clears throat> that He's honored when we bring Him the first of, the, of what was produced by this blessing that He has given us. Then fifthly, we see the tabernacle was divinely scheduled to be built on the first day of the first month. This blessed me when I saw it. 
So we're talking about back in Exodus, right? You had, you had Moses and they were traveling and they weren't, the, every time the, the cloud moved, they moved with the cloud and the pillar of fire. But then they had to have a temple. And so what they had, instead of just a building, they had a tent, a mobile temple. This tabernacle was told us or told them to be built or erected on the first day of the first month. In Exodus chapter 40, verse 2, On the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. In Exodus 40, verse 17, we see it fulfilled. It says, And it came to pass in the first month of the second year, on the which day? The first day of the month, that the tabernacle was, I love this, raised up. It was raised up. It's so significant. You know why? Because the tabernacle, which is a temple, is in fact a type of Christ himself. And just like the tabernacle was raised on the first day, so also Jesus was raised on the first day of that week, which is Sunday. As a matter of fact, number six, we attend church on the first day of the week to celebrate the very resurrection that took place on the first day of the week 2,000 years ago. Did you know that's why we actually attend services on Sunday mornings? Because Sunday morning is the first day. Every single Sunday morning is a celebration of that resurrection that took place. And throughout church history, they always met on the first day of the week in order to commemorate, to remind themselves, and to celebrate that wonderful moment, His resurrection. Look at Mark 16, verse 9. Now, when He rose early on the first day of the week, Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, Sunday. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven demons. John 20, verse 1. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and she saw that the stone was rolled away. John 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week. It's amazing how Scripture just keeps on driving that nail home, isn't it? It's just going to keep on talking about (laughs) how important this first thing is. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, watch this. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them all night long. I remember once we were meeting in a hotel out in, out in uh, I believe it was Arlington Heights, There was this lady in the church that was real vocal. Pam, you may remember her. But she always sat real in the front and she was very vocal and she always had a notepad. And and after every service, she would come to me and she would show me certain things that she wrote down. And Anyway, I was saying how Paul preached all night long. I mean, so long, somebody fell asleep in the window, fell out and died, broke his neck. Paul went down, raised him from the dead. And then he carried on preaching. I said, and you guys struggled to sit here for 45 minutes and listen. He preached all night. From the front row, she goes, yeah, I'd also stay if you could raise the dead. (laughs) Well, there went my sermon. (laughs) Number seven, the early church brought their offering on the first day of the week. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, on the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up. Number eight, and Jesus places himself first in order, in rank, and in priority when he said in Revelation 22, verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning. I am the first and the last. Something about that. Law of the first. Revelation 2, 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you. He says that you have left your what? Your first love. Your first love. So in a nutshell, and there's more to to find in regards to this law of the first, but in a nutshell, we see right here this morning 
the emphasis God places on the first by the firstborn, by the first fruits, by the first love, by uh, erecting the temple on the first day, by Jesus rising on the first day of the week. In Scripture, the Hebrew word that is used for first is the word, and I, and I got this new Bible program. I'm so excited about it. Do you mind throwing it up there? The word first in Hebrew is the word proton. The word proton. Uh, the meaning of this word proton is expressed in three different distinct ways. Three different distinct ways. The first is in time, then in priority, then in rank. Now, uh, we're just going to dive in deep over here to understand what does the Bible mean when it says first? I want the firstborn, the first fruits. Don't walk away from your first love. What is it talking about when it says first? Well, the word proton is in time. Proton refers to first as beginning. In priority, proton refers to first as that which is highest in importance. Uh, first in Hebrew, the word proton refers to that in rank, not just in time, in priority, but in rank, authority. Proton refers to the chief, the head of all things, to whom all must give an account, the ultimate authority. So when it says first, it says it has to be first in time, first in priority, and it must be first in rank. So when we talk about putting God first, we are therefore referring to putting God in the beginning of everything we plan and choose to do. This is why James said, like, it's okay if you choose to go and live in a city to go and work there and make money. It's fine. But why so arrogant? Why don't you say, if it be thy will, if it be the Lord's will, then I will go and do that and it will succeed. In other words, everything we do needs to be done prayerfully. We make choices, decisions, and we design companies, and we choose to do things based on the blueprint that the blueprint of Scripture. In other words, you're not going to go out there and start a life that you know is already contrary to Scripture. God's not going to bless your rebellion. God's not going to... Uh, bless your disobedience. Like, God, please, bless. Lord, <laughs> I'm opening this nightclub. I'm asking you, God, please, I need your blessing upon this nightclub. It's like, that's not going to work, right? So the point here is that in the beginning of what you choose to do, you have to come humbly before the Lord and decide and see whether this you're choosing to do is going to be God glorifying. Now you might say, well, Jacques, I think I've known that. This is actually decision-making 101. If you are going to make a choice, a decision in life, the first question you have to ask yourself is, is it a sin? Does it contradict Scripture? The second thing you have to ask yourself is, is this the most God-glorifying choice I can make? Is this the most God-glorifying thing I can give my life to? So that's in time. The first thing we do is we go to God to see if, in fact, the thing we're choosing to do is going to reflect His character more than another thing we could possibly do. That is, proton, in time, refers to the beginning of what I choose to do. Secondly, in priority, putting God's agenda for what I'm about to do as the reason and the motive for me doing it. I'm about to go do something. But I'm going to go and do it, not for God. Well, then that is not putting God first. If I'm about to go and get married for every reason but to have my marriage reflect the gospel between Christ and His church. If I'm going to get married for every reason other than that. Let me say it differently. If I'm going to do it only for all these reasons but not that, then I haven't put God first. The most important reason for getting married is how can we glorify God in a marriage together? In child rearing, how can I, the reason I'm raising my child the way I raise my child is because I want my parenting to be proton. In other words, 
putting God's agenda at the top of me parenting. Right? So first, the way I start choosing to be married or choosing to parent or choosing to start a company or choosing to take a job or choosing to go to, to have a career, whatever it is I choose to do, it needs to be because if it be your will, how can I glorify you with this? And then when I do it, I do it for the reason of glorifying God and finally putting God as chief, in other words, in rank, as the head, the overseer of all that I choose to do. In other words, what I do is, in my marriage, I answer to God. In my parenting, I answer to God. In my job, I answer to God. In me building a company, I answer to God. In the relationships I build, I answer to God. God, did this glorify you the way I went about business today? That's why oftentimes you will find people who know how to put God first oftentimes will do the thing that's not necessarily the most profitable, but the most God-glorifying. This is exactly what is meant by the first out of the Ten Commandments. Again, here we go first. What's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. That's what you're saying. Put me first. This does not mean other things in life cannot be important to you. This is where people mistake in it. Let me say it again. When he says, you will have nothing before me, no other gods before me. I always used to sit and listen to ministers going like, but how my, my parents are important to me. My siblings are important to me. Now my wife is important. My children are important. My job is important. Money is important. Now, God didn't say those things aren't important. He's saying, you will have no other God before me. This means that nothing may take the most, the superlative place in your life, whether it's in time, in priority, agenda, or in rank. Nothing can take that place. Only God can have it. So in other words, nothing may take God's place in order, in rank, in priority, or in value. In value. Can everybody please say value? Yeah. Let me just quickly drive a point home here. We've talked about this before. But the word worship comes from where? The word worth. Ship. The word worth. Ship is the word worship. In simple language, plainly stated, the thing that you hold most valuable in your life is the thing that has most worth to you, is the thing you worship. You cannot be more vested and find more security in and hold of greater value something like gold and worship God at the same time. That's not how you are worshiping gold or you are worshiping a relationship. Some people walk away from God because their spouse doesn't want to worship God. They have put more worth in that relationship they have with their spouse or the peace that they create by, by walking away from God. They worship peace instead of God by making peace more important than worshiping God. Does that make sense? Rather live in strife at home and serve the Lord wholeheartedly, no matter what the spouse thinks. Others in their child rearing, they don't want to come on too strong, religiously speaking, with their child because they want to keep their child. Like if you think that you're going to compromise your way into raising a God fearing child, that's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how it works, right, Tony? I mean, you literally have to draw lines. And you literally have to help them understand. It's, my, it's way more valuable for me to honor God than to please man in any way. So if we're talking about importance, the thing that is most valuable to us is the thing we worship. 
And this is what Exodus 23 verse 3 says. You shall have no other God before you. you. In other words, you shall worship nothing else other than God. In other words, yeah, many things are valuable, many things are important, but you cannot have most important, most valuable, anything but Him. People say, Lord, there's so much to think about. Have you ever felt this way? When you come to, to the Bible, there are like hundreds of doctrines. There are like hundreds of truths. Like you just keep digging and digging and you're always like, I didn't, th- I didn't know that that was a doctrine. I didn't know that this was a principle. I didn't know that that was a commandment. I don't know. This is an expectation. How many of you feel that way sometimes? You learn something, you open up the Bible, you go like, I- honestly, I thought I knew everything. Look at this. <laughs> That's why none of us are going to be the same person in a year's time. Did you know that? At least that's if you are moldable, willing, and pliable, teachable. If you are, you will not be the same person in a year. You will have changed. I was ministering to somebody not too long ago, and they said to me, but I listened to a sermon you taught seven years ago, and you, didn't, you taught the opposite. I'm like, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> that proves something, doesn't it? That proves something. That proves that I, I'm not married to my own opinions. I'm married to whatever else I get to learn from Scripture. Tina and I were up in Moscow, Idaho, and we were talking to Pastor Doug's wife, Nancy, and uh, somebody from stage had very piously stated, this was a guest speaker, right? Very piously stated, well, we believe in holding fast to the truth we know. Well, what if that truth you know is wrong? Could you change if God walks into the room and says, hey, can you see? Can you see that verse? And you go like, yeah, but I've, n- I've taught it differently. <laughs> it's like, like, no, if God points something out to you, it's so that you could change, so that you could grow. Anything that grows always changes. I cannot grow if I don't change. So all of us will be different In a year's time, in five years' time, in ten years' time. But people come and say, Lord, there's so many doctrines in the Bible. There's so many truths to learn, to understand, to submit to. It's becoming wearisome. Can't you just make it simple? Make it easy. Give me one point. Give me something to focus on. Give me one understandable directive. I can do with one. And Jesus said, okay, I'll do just that. He makes it simple, understandable. And he says in Matthew 6, 33, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first. When? First. Before, in time, in priority, and in rank. Seek first, in value, the most valuable thing, you are seeking after ought to be the righteousness of God, His kingdom and His righteousness. His kingdom and His righteousness. So Jesus is literally telling us where the emphasis of our life should be. He's pointing out where the emphasis of your, of, of your focus is, what, what you ought to be majoring in, is seeking after His kingdom and His righteousness, and then don't worry about it. All the other things will be added. All the other things will come to you if you first seek His kingdom. I want to show you something quick. Do you know every truth is also true backwards? Every truth is also true in the opposite. For instance, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, And all these things will be given to you as well from God's hand. Now, let's go negative. But if you do not seek first His kingdom, in other words, you don't seek His kingdom and you don't seek it first, then all these things will not be given to you as well. So that's what I'm saying. Every truth is also true backwards. I tell you, nobody's ever harmed me more than me. Isn't that true for you? 
I am my own greatest enemy. Look at it. Because instead of just seeking the kingdom of God always and his righteousness, sometimes you get so distracted, you're chasing after so many other things in life, and you don't realize that that is how to not receive all, everything else. <laughs> that's, that's how to stop all other things from coming your way. And so God will give what you need. He will always supply the grace, the strength. But there's the law of the first at work. So Jesus is pointing out the emphasis of my life. He's pointing out the emphasis of your life, the focus of your life, the, the thing you ought to be majoring in, and that is seeking after his kingdom. Jonathan Edwards said this, the seeking of God's kingdom and the pursuit of righteousness is the main and central business of every Christian life. So I'll close with this. Take inventory of your priorities. Take inventory of your priorities. Take inventory of the order of things in your life. Take inventory of what you value. What's worth, the greatest worth to you? What things do you find worth in? And compare it to the, to the way, the urgency in which you pursue the kingdom of God and the things of God. Because let me tell you, you pursue hardest after the thing you value the most. You pursue hardest after the thing that you hold most valuable. So take inventory of your priorities. Take inventory of how you order things in your life. Take inventory of what you value most in your life. Take inventory of your loves because he rebuked them for no longer having that first love. Let's pray. Lord, today uh, we take inventory of the things that we prioritize, the things that we have placed in different ranks, different compartments we place in time. Lord, that we will start by putting you first. We cannot put you first only by having an intention Intentions mean nothing. We don't put you first by wanting to. We put you first when we actually do it. James said, Be he doers of the word and not hearers only, or else you'd be deceiving yourself. I, Lord, am oftentimes my greatest enemy. Help me, God. See things for what they are. With your, with your lenses on, let me see the truth. Lord, help us prioritize. Help us start right. Help us put you first in all things. And Lord, help us love you as we did at first. In Jesus' name. While every head's bowed, every eye's closed. If that is you, you are taking inventory and you realize that it's easy to say, that God is first in my life. The question is, is that true? Or are you just deceiving yourself? Are those just nice words that stroke the conscience? Or are those real things in your life? Have you placed God on the back burner? Have you placed His Word on the back burner? You're always busy, busy, busy. You're chasing hard after all these things you value while at the same time you are convinced in your own mind that you have made him first. If that is you, this is a moment to repent, to say, God, I need to take inventory. God, I know this principle of the first is at work in my life. You said seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right doing before God. And all these things will be added unto me. But Lord, instead, I've been chasing after all these things to be added without putting you first. In other words, I have placed other gods before you. Forgive me, God. Forgive me, Lord. Help me, God.
by your grace to put you first in all things, to consult you, to come to you before I even make a decision, knowing that the choices I make to my knowledge are the best ways of glorifying you with the life that I was given. In Jesus' name, amen.